Welcome to TV Africa News and thank you for joining us. This is Africa Today. My name is Najuma Luima, but first are the headlines. No urgent need for Kakwenza to seek medical attention abroad. Court rules. Police warns public of criminals disguising as riders as border borders resume night operations. Firefighters extinguish blaze at Abdel National Park. Say in PG starts another stint with Mbarara City at Busoga United. I want to welcome us again now the news in detail. Buganda Road Chief Magistrate's Court has ruled that there is no need for novelist Kakwenza Rukirabashaija to seek medical attention abroad and therefore declined to release his passport to enable his travel. We have more. The critical author who is battling charges related to offensive communication in regards to the tweets he made about President Museveni and Commander Land Forces Lieutenant General Mohos Kaini Rukaba last month requested court to allow him access to his passport to enable him travel abroad for proper treatment following torture while in detention. On Monday afternoon, the Chief Magistrate, Dr. Douglas Singiza, ruled that there is no urgent need for Kakwenza to get treatment abroad. Dr. Singiza ruled that a review of the medical report presented does not show that Kakwenza needs urgent treatment abroad. Kakwenza's lawyers had presented to court documents from Zambia Hospital indicating that he has blood clot under the nails. One of the nails is out of the nail bed, healing bruises all over his buttocks, back, thighs and other parts of the body and wanted court to allow him travel abroad for further treatment. The magistrate also threw out a request by the critical writer to have the court stay proceedings until the High Court has ruled on the validity of the charges against him. He ruled that there will be no prejudice suffered by Kakwenza if court continues with the case. Government has pledged to increase budget for the Higher Education Students Financing Board following a high demand of loan applications of continuing students from different institutions of learning. This was revealed as government released two of the lists of successful loan students for the academic year 2021-2022. Nalugo reports. Addressing journalists at the Government Media Center in Kampala, the State Minister for Primary Education, Dr. Joyce Moriku Kaduchu, said government recognizes the increasing demand for loan application from students of higher learning institutions, hence pledging to increase budget for the Higher Education Students Financing Board in order to beat the increasing demand for loans. We recognize the increasing demand for the student loans as evidence in this year's application to the board. And on behalf of government, I wish to pledge a total commitment to increase the budget to support more disadvantaged students to start and to complete their studies. The Higher Education Students Financing Board is meant for Ugandan scholars only, pursuing higher education in recognized public and private institutions of higher learning. The board supports 58 institutions with 9 public universities and 13 private universities. Uh, the private universities that uh, we partner with are 12 in number. Our uh, minister, this is uh, Bishop Stuart University, Gemma University, this is Bart University, Islamic University of Uganda, Kampala International University, Kampala University, Mountain of the Moon University, Lady University. Mumbai University, Uganda Christian University, and Uganda Matal University. So these are the ones that have uh, finalized the admission process uh, for which uh, we open on 11 October 2021 and then close on 30th November. This academic year, the board received 6,023 loan applications but however managed to give a total of 1,530 students loans to pursue higher education. 
Since 2014, when the body came into existence, a total of 11,187 students have so far benefited from this program. Minister Kaduchu, however, applauded female applicants for performing better than their male counterparts, therefore called upon girls to push more effort in science subjects at secondary level. And I want to call upon all the girls to continue working hard, girls, continue to work hard in science subjects especially. Science subjects at secondary education level. As we continue to increase the number of girls in science education. The minister also called upon the general public not to neglect children with disabilities and urged the beneficiaries of the Higher Education Students Financing Board to stay committed to their studies and be disciplined in order to achieve their career dreams. Nalugo Muyingo, Africa Today. Police have warned members of the public to be vigilant and conscious of criminals that are disguising as border border riders. President Museveni's directive to lift curfew so border borders resume night operations after over two years of restrictions in a bid to control the spread of COVID. Let's take a look. Addressing journalists on Monday, police spokesperson Fred Nanga said since there is no scrutiny, a number of those disguising as border border riders are criminals. The police spokesperson urged members of the public to avoid border borders with titled or faded number plates, those that keep making stopovers during journeys, especially at night, and those which have colleagues trailing them. Enanga explained that in most cases, those with others following them are criminals who are waiting for the opportunity to pounce on the passenger before both border borders take off. Enanga said there is also a new trick where you are being ridden on a border border, but he has accomplices trading you who later attack and rob you clean and warned people not to board border borders with titled number plates. A number of people have in the past reported cases of being robbed, whereas others have been reported killed by criminals disguising as border border riders. Many of these target mobile phones and ladies' bags for those who normally move at night and in dark spots. Let's take a quick break. We will be right back. Welcome back. You're still watching TV Africa News, The Right to Know. A fire that raged for two days in Kenya's Abdal National Park has been extinguished after burning through hundreds of hectares of wilderness, a government forest official said on Monday. The blaze started Saturday and dozens of forest rangers, firefighters and volunteers had struggled to control the fire from spreading as suspicions of arson emerged. The park was etched in history when Britain's Elizabeth II then a princess on a 1952 visit to Kenya received news of her father's death while staying at the Treetops Hotel, a remote game-watching lodge built high into a tree in the Abadel Forest. Rhino Ark, a conservation charity in Kenya, earlier said it had sent in helicopters to conduct area surveys of the area to estimate the extent of damage to the forest cover. The group said on Twitter on Monday, that 35 trained firefighters have been deployed by chopper on the southern fire line. The park lies some 100 kilometers north of the capital Nairobi in the Abadel mountain range. It is home to spectacular waterfalls and lush bamboo jungles, as well as a variety of wildlife including leopards, elephants, and critically endangered rhinos. The Abadeas are the third highest mountain range in Kenya, reaching a summit of just over 4,000 meters. In recent days, Concern has grown over a contentious proposal before Parliament which could allow politicians to determine if public forests can be carved out and handed over to private interests. The amendment to the Forest Conservation and Management Act reforms passed after decades of rampant land clearing has roused significant community anger and sparked fears that it could result in unchecked logging and environmental destruction. 
poor rainfall in the last quarter of 2021, the third consecutive failed rainy season, followed a devastating locust invasion a year earlier, with animals now too weak to produce milk or too skinny to be sold. We have more on this report. President Uhuru Kenyatta declared the drought a natural disaster last September with 2.1 million people, 4% of Kenya's population, already grappling with hunger, according to government figures. The government said last week that 23 of the country's 47 counties faced food and water stress, while the Meteorological Department has warned of a potential increase in human-to-human -human and human-to-wildlife conflicts. The authorities have invested 450 million shillings to buy 11,250 cattle and 3,200 goats from farmers in the worst heat counties. East Africa endured a harrowing drought in 2017, which also brought neighboring Somalia to the brink of famine. In 2011, two successive failed rainy seasons in 12 months led to the driest year since 1951 in arid regions of Kenya, Somalia, Ethiopia, Djibouti and Uganda. With conflicts raging in Ethiopia and Somalia, aid agencies are struggling to assess the true extent of the current crisis. Nomadic livestock herders in East Africa's trilands have learned to cope with the vagaries of weather over decades, driving their relentless search for water and pasture in some of the world's most inhospitable terrain. But their resilience is being severely tested by climate change. Moving on, lawmakers in the Libyan capital of Tripoli began talks on Sunday on the future of their government more than a month after the country failed to hold its first presidential election. The first deputy speaker of the House of Representatives, Fawzi al Nuili, invited deputies to the meeting to coordinate efforts on the roadmap. We have more on this story. The meeting between 46 deputies came before a session on Monday in which the Libyan House of Representatives will discuss choosing a new prime minister. Al-Nuri said in a news conference held after the meeting that the session aims to create a state of consensus with all Libyan parties in order to move forward within a roadmap that will prioritize elections and the constitutional base. There are also plans to choose the executive authority complete national reconciliation, unify the nation's security by arresting armed groups and evacuating all foreign forces from the country. Meanwhile, the head of the High Council of State in Libya, Khalid al-Mashri, called on the House of Representatives to adopt an integrated roadmap for the next stage, warning that a decision to change the executive authority unilaterally would lead to the birth of a dead government. Libya plunged into turmoil after a NATO-backed uprising in 2011, toppled President Muammar Gaddafi, who was later killed. He then became divided between rival governments, one in the east, backed by Hifta, and a UN-supported administration in the capital Tripoli, each supported by different militias and foreign powers. Away from that, on Monday, President Cyril Ramaphosa released a report he commissioned to an expert panel that shows that July 2021, civil unrest where over 300 people were killed, leaving hundreds bankrupt. Last August, President Cyril Ramaphosa tasked panelists to lead a critical review of the security services' preparedness. They have concluded the response by the security services was not sufficient. The 159-page report found there had been a failure of state institutions in disrupting and anticipating the troubles. The July 2021 unrest occurred during a tough economic period, coupled with a tense political climate, which saw former President Zuma's imprisonment. According to the panelists, poorly rolled out programs of service delivery and unacceptable living conditions, the state of the economy and the persistent levels of poverty served to provide the ripe environment 
to light the tinder box that was the incarceration of former president zuma that led to many poor and desperate people joining in the looting alongside those more calculating in their objectives and motivation over the days the protests turned into riots people went rampaging through parts of the kwazul natal and guateng provinces despite security forces the looting and arson continued to spread until the deployment of the military the panel who authored the report also made recommendations on how to strengthen security capabilities let's once again take a quick break we will be right back In our business news today, Egyptian President Abdel Fatel El Sis hosted Ismail Omar Guley, Djibouti's president, on Monday, February 7th. The heads of state discussed the Ethiopian Renaissance Dam project, which is under construction on the Nile River. Egypt's president met with Djiboutian counterpart on Monday. It was part of Egypt's efforts to build more African alliances amid an ongoing water dispute with Ethiopia. During the talks in Cairo, Abdel Fattah el-Sisi and Ismail Omar Gwela discussed the controversial dam Ethiopia is building on the Nile River's main tributary. Egypt deems the dam an existential threat. At a joint press conference, the Egyptian leader reiterated his government's demand of achieving a legally binding agreement on the feeding and operating the dam according to the rules of international law and security council decisions. Gwela said he and his Egyptian counterpart also discussed strengthening relations between their two nations on all levels. Gwela's visit to Cairo comes more than eight months after El Sisi paid visit to the strategic horn of African nation. El Sisi was then the first Egyptian leader to land in Djibouti since it declared independence in 1977. <laughs> In our health news today, David Senfuka, a Ugandan herbalist treating cancer, diabetes and other ailments, has announced the suspension of treatment and considering asylum in other countries due to continued threats against him and his herbal remedy. Named SD 2018, the herbal remedy has since gone through animal trials and according to the results, it is not only a remedy for diabetes but also curative. Government recently gave a green light to Sinfoka to carry out clinical trials for his herbal remedy after it passed tests on product safety. President Museveni also recently reached out to Sinfoka and pledged support to him. However, addressing journalists at the Makelele Guest House on Monday morning, Senfuka said following the announcement that the president has pledged support to his research, he has received several threats that he says have forced him to think otherwise. Senfuka told journalists that some of the people behind his wars that he described as mafia are the individual medics from the Uganda Cancer Institute whom he accused of feeling jealousy over his herbal remedy. He said that the campaign against his herbal remedy is done on the account of his academic limitation and the doubts rendered to traditional medicine. 
Sefka explained that the people he termed as mafia have described his remedy as primitive and can't offer solution to today's scientific challenges. He noted that because of the reluctancy to render the coveted support, he has sought all the available means to popularize his discovery. Senfoka said that he sees no reason as to why his diabetes and cancer herbal cure has not been recognized for onus as a national achievement as it has always been done in other jurisdictions despite bringing it to the attention of the responsible state players. <laughs> And finally, in our sports news today, Sadiq Sempiji will be the man in the spotlight when Barada City visits Abusoga United in a relegation six-pointer at Kakindu. Uh, that tactician uh, returned to the Ankole Lions for another stint, having worked at the club in two capacities, assistant and acting head coach, respectively. We have more. The visitors who lie to love with 15 points on the table are aware that nothing short of a win could see them get embroiled in a relegation battle. But they must dig beyond to get their first away win against Busoga United, who has won all three home meetings. The hosts come into the game on the back of a 3-1 defeat to URA in a game they dominated but lost and will hope to convert dominancy into victory in front of their home fans. The reverse fixture at Kacheka ended in a 1-1 stalemate with the hosts conceding a late goal. Elsewhere on the day on Paraka visit Bottom Place to Toro United at Bohinga. That was the news. Thank you for always keeping it TV Africa. Please do stay tuned. More